Okay, so this is our last video for time period one. Uh, so in this video, we're going to just wrap things up briefly by talking about some post Renaissance art. So we'll be looking at a few examples of post Renaissance art. Uh, so we're not going to take a whole lot of notes here, uh, but I will be talking about several pieces of art, a few artists. Um, so just kind of keep track of these names uh, as we go through this video. Uh, so once we get to the end of the Renaissance uh, and into the mid part of the 16th century, um, artists... I guess we can say kind of perfected the ideas of Renaissance art. So they kind of perfected the ideas of Renaissance art. And remember, you might see this described as naturalism, which is the name that art historians would give to the art of the Renaissance. So naturalism. Uh, and remember that not only were they being artists, but they were also kind of advertising their skills as artists, but also as scientists, uh, mathematicians, mathematicians. I don't think I spelt that right. Math people. We'll just say math people. Spelling is hard today. Uh, scientists, mathematicians, uh, I guess just generally Renaissance men. But once you kind of have mastered a skill, it kind of gets boring. And so these later art movements of time period one kind of see artists showing off. Like they're kind of bored with uh, their mastery of the subject. So for instance, like if you are really good at uh, like playing billiards or shooting basketballs, you might try, once you get really good at doing that stuff, you might try to do a number of like trick shots just to show off how really good you are to kind of keep your interest in the subject. And I kind of see this post-Renaissance art, or at least the first art movement we're gonna talk about like this. This is like the artistic equivalent of trick shots. So this first art movement is called mannerism. And mannerism kind of takes us from like the mid 1500s, kind of to the early 1600s. So these art movements are very fluid and there aren't like hard and firm dates for when they start, but we kind of see mannerism start towards the middle of the 1500s and it's gonna keep going until the early 1600s, although you'll see examples of mannerist work uh, before the mid 1500s and after the early 1600s. Remember, it's it's just a fluid kind of thing. There aren't hard and firm dates for a lot of this stuff. So what mannerism does is that we see the uh, very detailed natural environments 
that we see in Renaissance art, but we see them like distorted on purpose. So we'll see people look like people, but we're so good at depicting people now that we distort them on purpose to kind of get people to pay attention to it. People have been used to Renaissance art for now like 150 years. And if we make a little change in how people actually look, we're going to see people pay attention to the art again. So we're going to see things that are distorted on purpose. Uh, maybe the most important Mannerist painter. I'll give you one name. He's known as El Greco. So he was, uh, he painted in Spain, but he was. Motion detected at the camera two. He was from Greece. And that's why he's called El Greco. So he's the Greek. Um, so here are a couple of pieces from El Greco and I'll just bring them up here so you can see them. Um, this first one doesn't look at first glance to be that weird. So this is a motion detected at the camera too. This is a this is a portrait of a saint. So this is uh, a portrait of Saint Ildefonso, who is not a person you need to pay attention to at all. You don't need to know who this is. And the reason I bring this painting up to you is to highlight the hand of this person because while everything else looks mostly in proportion, this hand does not. So if we zoom in on the hand a little bit more, you can see that his middle fingers are kind of at a weird angle. And the more you pay attention to this painting, the more you see kind of like, he looks like he's like taller than normal uh, his neck looks a little bit longer than you might expect. He's wearing this robe that kind of makes it harder to see his proportions. But I mean, this hand is a very odd choice, considering that everything else looks so normal and natural. This hand does look odd. So the hand, specifically, of Saint Ildefonso, and this was painted in... 1597. Uh, another one we might look at is this. This is a landscape by El Greco. So this is a, a landscape. It's called the View of Toledo, which is a city in Spain. This is 1595. And you can see that like it looks normal, like it looks like a regular landscape, but it's got kind of this like off-putting vibe to it. It doesn't feel completely natural. A lot of Mannerist painters painted on black canvases so that when there was light, so you can see the light up here, it really stands out, but it also gives it this kind of like dark, kind of otherworldly effect to it, the clouds look very ominous. There's like a claustrophobic effect to this. And so there is like in like a subtle emotional effect. here that looking at this painting kind of makes you feel closed in it makes you feel a little claustrophobic it's a regular landscape 
we wouldn't this wouldn't feel out of place looking at it in a renaissance discussion but you get this kind of weird feeling by looking at it now that's one guy and those are very subtle things but i did want to give you one like very exaggerated look at mannerism uh, this is by another artist that's not nearly as famous. His name is, he's known as Parmi Giannino. And this painting has a name, but it's known as the Madonna with the long neck. And you'll see why it's called that when I show it to you. So when you look at this, again, it doesn't look like it's all that different from other Renaissance paintings. And so this was 1535. But when you start to like pick this apart, there's a lot of weird stuff we see in this painting. So for example, like the name implies, her neck is like abnormally long. But then you see her hand again and her fingers are kind of abnormally long. And the more you look at it, the more questions you have, like how tall is she? Because if she's sitting down, she must be like, 10 feet tall considering that these people seem to be like they are normal sized if she's not sitting down then her legs are kind of bent in these weird angles uh maybe she's squatting i don't know but we get this kind of weird we get these weird proportions looking at her and then if you look at baby Jesus here who's supposed to be a baby but looks like he's about I don't know six or seven years old we also see all of these weird proportions for him too like his shoulder looks like it's dislocated um, and then is this guy in the background or is that guy just really small so there's a lot of like off-putting things and the more you look at this painting the more you start to notice all of these odd choices that Parmigianino made making this painting. So those are just three examples of mannerism. Eventually mannerism is going to give way to the other more important art movement of the post-Renaissance period. So eventually what we're going to see is that instead of these, I'll just go out and say that they're weird uh, proportions in paintings, what later artists started adding into their paintings to like challenge themselves was that painters now add emotion like can we add some emotion to our paintings instead of these weird proportions that should be challenging enough so what we're going to see in this next art movement which is much more influential so this art movement is called baroque art So mannerism kind of gives a kind of serves as a segue between Renaissance art and and Baroque art. So mannerism is kind of the bridge. Baroque art is going to be much more influential and Baroque art is going to take us well into time period two. Uh, it's going to stick around for most of time period two until we get to the enlightenment and the french revolution when it will eventually go away on its own but we'll worry about that uh, when we get to that now baroque art is about adding emotion to the art uh, so we're going to look at some 
pieces of Baroque art now. Uh, the first one I want to bring up kind of finishes our trilogy of Davids, right? So we looked at uh, Donatello's David, which kind of shows the absence of humanism. Like this was a kid that needed God's help to kill Goliath. Then we looked at Michelangelo's David. which shows us the influence of humanism. And we're gonna add in one more David to finish off this trilogy of Davids. And this is Bernini's David. So we're still gonna have this influence of humanism But now we're going to add to that emotion. So if you remember, both Donatello's David and Michelangelo's David were pretty serene. It didn't look like they were about to go into battle. They just looked like how they would look on a regular day. And oh, by the way, I'm about to go fight this giant nine foot tall soldier in a battle to the death. Bernini's David is going to add that emotional element to it. So let's take a look at Bernini's David. This is a David who is in the process of fighting. And you can see if you look at his face, if we zoom in on his face, There is this sense that he is like angry, determined. We get this sense of anger and determination that we don't see in the other Davids. So we get this emotional component. And Additionally, we also get this sense of motion. Like you can tell that he's like winding up to sling a rock at Goliath. Donatello's David, Michelangelo's David, you don't see that. They're just standing perfectly still, perfectly serene. They're not doing anything. But now we can see that the artist is trying to imply both an emotion and motion. This looks like a snapshot of the actual battle. Another important Baroque artist is... So her name is Artemisia Gentilski. So she is an Italian Baroque artist. Baroque. And I bring her up because one, we don't often get a chance to talk about women, especially early on in this course, and she is a very important Baroque artist. Uh, but she also kind of weaves her own story into the art that she paints. Uh, so let me give you the story of the painting we're gonna look at. So. She, her most famous piece is called Judith Slaying Holofernes. Holofernes. So this is a Bible story. And long story short, Holofernes was, I believe, an Assyrian general. 
and they are uh, the Assyrians were attacking the Hebrews and Judith was a Hebrew princess uh, and Holofernes took her prisoner and kind of added her to his harem of, of women and Judith ends up killing her law for knees. That's kind of the end of the story. Uh, and it's a story that's been told many times through, uh, through the church, but also through painting. And here is an example of this from the Renaissance. So in the Renaissance, we have Holofernes back here. He's dead. Here's Judith. Here's Holofernes' head and the sword that she used to cut his head off with. Uh, if you look at the expression on her face, she looks just like David did as he was about to go fight Goliath. Uh, when I've asked students in, in the past what emotion you might get off of her face, uh, the answer is uh, boredom which seems like an odd emotion to have after you've just killed someone, but she looks bored. She looks like nothing has happened. She's holding a, a man's head uh, and she looks bored. This is a pretty good example of what we'd see in the Renaissance. There's no emotion here, but you have good depictions of like, that's what a foot looks like and this is what a person looks like. So it's a good example of Renaissance art, but we're not in the Renaissance anymore. We've gone past it. So now let's look at what Gentilski came up with. So here is Gentilski's version of the same story. So here you can see like the like like determined anger in Judith's face. You can kind of see the shock and surprise on Holofernes's face. Uh, you can tell that there's action going on. Um, and one thing that you need to note is that swords aren't meant for cutting off heads. Swords aren't meant for sawing. Swords are meant for stabbing. So cutting off someone's head this way, like you would with a saw, requires a lot of strength and effort and you see that in their faces and in, in Judith and her servants faces that this is requiring all of their strength to hold him down and do this work. Now the other reason I bring up Gentilski is that she often used herself as a model for the women in her painting. And so this is kind of a self-portrait of Gentilski. This painting also reflects something that happened in her life. So Gentilski was from a pretty well-off Italian family. I think they were from Florence. And her father noticed her talent for art and set her up with several art tutors, one of which ended up raping her. Uh, and kind of in an odd situation for the time, the, the rape was brought to the authorities and the guy was actually put on trial and he was actually convicted of the crime, although he didn't actually do the sentence, which was exile from the city. Uh, but he was convicted of the crime but he didn't really get punished. So Gentilski put her attacker in the painting. That's him. So this serves as a permanent reminder that this is the, this is the social punishment for what you did. Even if you wouldn't be actually punished, this is the social punishment for what you did. And this turned into a giant scandal. And for a long time, Gentilski was kind of forgotten about in art circles because she was so public in her accusal of her attacker. 
Uh, but in the late 19th and early 20th century, her story was rediscovered by feminists and she became kind of a feminist icon for actually standing up for the rights of women in in this manner. So she's very important. And I, I think I just read an article the other day that said that she's the first woman to get a uh, a, com a, a solo uh, gallery at one of the I think it's the one of the art museums in London is devoting an entire uh, an entire collection to her work uh, because she is so important and she was so groundbreaking as an artist. So uh, Artemisia Gentilski is a really good example of Baroque art but she's also a really early example of feminism and she's going to be picked up again when feminism actually becomes a movement in the uh, 19th century. So there's that. Uh, the last thing we want to talk about when we talk about Baroque art is that Baroque art also is reflected in a lot of architecture. So when we're thinking about Baroque architecture, it's meant to kind of uh, impress the viewer. Impress the viewer with like awe and wonder. So a lot of Baroque architecture is used by the church because the church wants to be seen as awesome and here's an example of that so this is another Bernini Bernini was not just a sculptor but he was also an architect and so that we're not looking at we're not looking at the building so this is in st. Peter's Basilica we're looking at this thing so it actually does kind of serve as a nice uh, difference between Renaissance art, which is what we see kind of all around it. And we see this very fine detail of this uh, canopy inside of St. Peter's Basilica. So there's this kind of rich, what is this thing called? The uh, Baldachin. I'm probably mispronouncing that inside St. Peter's Basilica. So again, you see these kinds of very intricate detail. Uh, it's kind of meant to make you feel small. Uh, and that's the point of this. It's supposed to make you impressed with who built it or who had it built um, and another group that this will kind of lead us into time period too. another group of people that really like Baroque architecture are absolute monarchs because they also want to impress the viewer with awe and wonder and so while we're not going to talk about this right now very much a lot of absolute monarchs are going to use baroque architecture to show off their wealth and power it's like a physical representation of their wealth and power and there's no better example of this than Versailles, where Louis XIV is going to live. So this is meant to make you feel small. It's meant to make you feel like whoever built this is really wealthy and powerful. And having been in the room myself, it, it does that. This, this room makes you feel those things. So we're going to look at this a lot when we get to absolute monarchy in a few weeks. 
but this is also another point of Baroque architecture. So uh, this ends all the stuff we need to do for time period one. So this is all the stuff that leads us up to 1648. Uh, We'll start with another set of videos starting in around the 1630s when we talk about the English Civil War. Uh, but for right now, this is all the stuff that'll be on the time period one exam. So uh, until we pick up with time period two, this is Mr. Nissen signing off.